very disturbing for people who were standing up for me. Thirdly,
Every five years, a new president is elected to the European Commission. Tonight, the candidates for the presidency come together to defend their positions and why they are best suited for the job. The candidate for the party of the European left is Violeta Tomic. Franz Timmermans is the candidate for the party of European Socialists. The candidate for the party of the Greens is Bas Eckhout. Guy Verhofstadt is the candidate for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. The candidate for the European Conservatives and Reformists group is Jan Zahadil. Each of these candidates wants to be the next president of the European Commission. But where do they stand on digital policies, sustainability and the future of Europe? How will they address the concerns of young citizens? Tonight, we find out. Welcome to the Maastricht Debate. Good evening and welcome to the Maastricht Debate, 2019's first debate between candidates for European Commission President. I'm Ryan Heath, the political editor of Politico Europe. And I'm Rianne Letschert, the rector magnificus of this university. And I think they chose us because of our names, Ryan. They might have what done do that. Think? Yes. Tonight, five candidates for the presidency of the European Commission will join us on stage to defend their vision, their ambitions for the future of Europe and why they are best suited for this job. We invited candidates from all the pan-European parties registered with the EU who are selected um, for candidate for European Commission president. Now, there are two candidates who are not on stage tonight. The first, Ariel Junqueras from the European Free Alliance, can't be here because he's in pre-trial detention in Spain. <laughs> the other, Manfred Weber of the European People's Party, is attending a celebration of his political mentor in Germany and declined our invitation, an invitation we offered a year ago. So make of that what you will. Now, the other thing that you will notice is the shortage of women on stage. Now, that was not the choice of the debate organizers, but the choice of the political parties. And you will understand that we will question you on this topic during this evening. Now, we're here in the bright... <laughs> We're here in the Vrijthof Theatre in Maastricht, in front of a packed audience, but there are people watching in all European countries, attending more than 40 events across the continent and following in English, French and German. And we're here for 90 minutes of pure debate, where we put the candidates under the microscope without scripts and without advisors. And you have noticed that this debate has a very special angle. We focus on the concerns of young people, many of them we will be voting for the first time. And Maastricht University and the European Youth Forum have surveyed young people in order to come to the themes of tonight. And these themes are digital Europe, sustainable Europe, and the future of Europe. Now remember, we want you to build on the debate about the debate by going online using the hashtag Maastricht Debate on whatever social platform you use. And of course, we also want you to tell us who you think is winning the debate. So you can go to slido.com, enter the tag Maastricht Debate and cast your vote. Now for the rules, we will use to ensure a fair debate, because that is, of course, important. Each candidate will have one minute to make an opening statement. It is fully your choice what you want to address in that minute. And we will rotate the order in which the candidate answers each other questions that follow. Now, when answering the question, we encourage you to respond to the previous speakers, challenge each other as well as answering the questions we put to you. We will ask you three types of questions over the next 90 minutes. The first is a type of question where we'll ask you to raise your hand if you agree with a statement that we make. The second is a fairly standard sort of question, a general question that all of you will be expected to answer. And the third type is a specific question, tailored to each of you, only one of you answers those questions. And any follow-up questions that we ask uh, will uh, be on the, the basis of following up your initial answer. Of course, if any candidate is directly attacked by one of the other candidates, they'll have a right of reply. 
And remember, the initial answers are limited to one minute. That's very important. And the right of reply and the follow-up answers are limited to 30 seconds. Now, a clock will be clearly visible to all of you, but also to our audience, so that we can also check this time. And remember, you don't have to use up all of your time. You can also be brief. Audience and young people love brief and non-fuzzy answers. So it's time for our opening statements. We're going to start with you, Franz Timmermans, from the Netherlands and the candidate of the European Socialists. You have one minute. Take it away. Thank you very much, and I'm really excited to be here. This is the place I was born. And when I was born here, my father was a policeman, military policeman, patrolling borders that are no longer there. And I see now people sitting here that would not be there 50 years ago. So, you know, if you want to know what the force of Europe is, look at Maastricht, and you know exactly what we can achieve. What I would like the young people here to do to tonight is to think, where do I want to be five years from now? Where do I want to be 10 years from now? And then take it from there and look at us, and then think who has the best plans for the next five years, for the next 10 years. I propose dialogue over confrontation. I propose equality over discrimination. I propose a sustainable future over a fossil fuel economy. I propose that we do this together and not give the nationalists any room. You know who did this last night? Pedro Sanchez. And he won the election in Spain. So there is hope for those choices, but the choice is yours. And never be indifferent. Choose. Perfect. David Kintai. Jan Zaradil from the Czech Republic and the European Conservative. It is your turn. Thank you. Hello, everyone. On Wednesday, it will be 15 years since my country joined the European Union. It was a good thing. Many changes happened over those last 15 years. Many changes are yet to happen, waiting for you. But I have to say that we are still not the same. We are still somehow different and we have to respect that. Do you know, for instance, what's the average salary here in the Netherlands? It's 2,000 euros. In my country, in the Czech Republic, it's 1,000 euros. So it's a very clear example that tailor-made solutions sometimes are necessary for coping with the problems and not always the Europe-wide solution is possible. What I would like to see is a new balance between national and European so that we could find together good solutions for the future. This is what I call flexible Europe and this is, in my feeling, the only way forward from the current deadlock. Next up. Next up, Geva Hofstadt from Belgium and the Liberals and Democrats. Yeah, I, I, I don't agree with him. Is that okay? Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, please. It's a debate. <laughs> uh, well, I think that the youth had to understand, and they understand it, that the world of tomorrow is a completely different world of the world of today. It will be a world of empires, a world of China dominating, India dominating, the US, the Russian Federation. And living in such a world is completely different than 20, 30 or 40 years ago. It will be a world in which our standards, our way of living, our values, our way of thinking of our youth is under threat of these empires. So we need to create really a strong Europe, a united Europe, as a counterweight for that. And for that, we need also a new force in the European Union and in this European debate, a centrist, pro-European force, a little bit away from the old tiled parties, socialist and EPP. Certainly the EPP is so tired that they are not on stage this evening after one week already. So it seems so to be that that is the crucial thing to do. A new Europe in a new world. Violeta Tomic of Slovenia and the European left. Please go ahead. Good evening, everybody. Nobody can deny that uh, today European Union is quite far away from ideas of democracy, equality and justice. For the bankers and stockbrokers in Frankfurt and City of London, the last economic crisis is just a distant memory. But for the people of Europe who pay this crisis with millions and billions of euros of austerity, effects are still here. All across Europe, working families are facing the same problem, how to pay the bills, how to assure 
the better future for their children. But the politicians in Brussels have time and time again put the interests of banks and corporations in front of interests of the people. And I'm not a Brussels insider like all these gentlemen here are. And I'm glad today that I can present to you the vision of uh, the European left. And your time the is up, Mr. Tomic. of people in front of the corporations. Thank you. And finally, we return to the Netherlands and Baz Eickhout from the European Greens. Thank you and good evening, everyone. My name is Baz Eickhout. And I was, before I went into politics, a climate change researcher. And climate change brought me into the political arena. And I think climate change is one of the greatest challenges that we need to tackle. And that is certainly one of my core beliefs that we need to tackle at the European level. Now, climate change is becoming more and more center stage, literally, tonight. <laughs> but I think it's more important that we not only talk about climate change, but also act on it. We as European Greens, we as Greens know how to act on climate. But we also know that action on climate change needs to go hand in hand with social justice. And that's exactly the new Europe that we are fighting for. A green and social Europe, so a different Europe. We believe in European cooperation, we believe in strengthening European democracy, but we want to see a socially just and green Europe. Thank you. Now, before we move to our first theme, Digital Europe, let's have a look at the polls, the results that we have now. Who do you think is leading the debate? So you can all use your devices. Now, the numbers might change. I see them shifting a little bit, but we've got Franz Timmermans in the lead. So that is a good start for you, Mr. Timmermans. But we've got votes for all parties following up. I think when we're going to see more people voting, we'll start to see a fuller picture of how you think the debate is going. But it's good to get that temperature test just as we dive into the debate. I think Paris it's now. Still far, they say in cycle. <laughs> exactly. We've got 80 minutes to go. So uh, keep your um, hats on. It's now time to turn to our first theme: digital Europe. The opportunities offered by the digital revolution are undeniable, but these are not without risks. From the Yellow Jackets movement to the hotly debated UN migration deal, the spread of disinformation has had undeniable consequences. It is estimated that by 2025, the amount of work done by machines will jump from 29 to more than 50%. But while young people are often thought to be digital natives, a recent survey found that only 18% of them feel they have the skills necessary to prepare them for the digital economy. The risk of cyber attack is growing for citizens as well as national and European institutions. A successful cyber attack against one member state could compromise the entirety of the European election process. The digital revolution raises many questions for the EU. How to protect citizens from disinformation online? How to invest in skills to compete with new technology? How to safeguard our information and data? And how can Europe maintain competitiveness in the digital economy vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Asia? As we move towards an increasingly digital future, how do the candidates plan to address these issues? And how will they make sure the voices of young people are heard? Now, as shown in the video, in 2019, we are learning also the downsides of the digital revolution. Just last week, Facebook's share price rose after news that it expects a 5 billion fine from the United States for privacy breaches. Now, in effect, Facebook is so big that a journalist wrote actually the other week that even a 5 billion fine is like a parking ticket for a company like Facebook. So the general question to all of you is, how big do the fines actually need to get? Or what new regulations will you propose to get the tech giants under control? And please also try to be specific in your answer. And the turn is first for you, Mr. Saradil. Oh. 60 seconds. Thank you. I believe we have done a lot. Uh, we have introduced a lot of legislation. And I have to say that as a European Commission, uh, I believe it should not act as a government of Europe, but it should rather assist and help national governments to do their job. What we have introduced were 30 pieces of legislation concerning digital single market. 
Uh, some of them very well protecting our privacy, some of them very well designed to protect us against cyber attacks. There are still things to do. For instance, the e-privacy directive is yet to be adopted by the next parliament. But I believe that we are doing well at the moment. I believe that we cope well with that existing problem. And one thing I wouldn't like to see when fighting with fake news and with this information is that we would restrict by doing that, we would restrict the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, because that, in my feeling, would be very dangerous. So is this an area where you would actually like to see more regulation? Because what I've learned from your party's position is that you're actually in favor of less regulation. But in this area, what, you would like to see I more. I believe, as I said, we adopted almost 30 pieces connected with digital single market. Now it's time to implement them. Now it's time for reflection, because individual member states have to implement them and they must be somehow checked out whether they properly work. If not, they could be improved, they could be changed, but in the European Parliament, on the European level, and when it comes to European Commission, I think we've done a good job. Thank you. OK, now we turn to you, Guy Verhofstadt. What would you do on the fines and the regulation? Well, uh, to start with uh, regulating, uh, because uh, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg came to the European Parliament, uh, the first thing what he said, no, no, it's not necessary, uh, this uh, regulation. We will manage it ourselves. A few weeks ago, you remember that, uh, Zuckerberg came on television and said, no, I have it not longer under control. We need regulation. So I think that, as we have already done with the GDPR on privacy, we need to go further. It's not to Mark Zuckerberg to tell us uh, with their... Uh, people were screening or Facebook in India, what is right and what is wrong. And the second thing what we need to do is to create our own internet model. We don't have it in Europe for the moment. It is the American model, uh, they take our data and make the profits with it, or it is the, and that I don't want, the Chinese model where they are following everybody. So I think we need our own model. And the only way to do it, because there are no big European digital companies, is to have finally one European regulator so that we don't need to have 28 authorizations before a young company can start something new on the internet. That's the way forward. So my follow-up there. <laughs> the obvious follow-up there is whether you would engage more directly with the tech giants. Jean-Claude Juncker, as Commission President, didn't really have those direct meetings and those head-banging sessions. Yeah, but and with countries like Ireland as well, they've done virtually nothing to enforce the General Data Protection Regulation. So you're saying rip that away from the national yeah, regulators like Because us. they don't listen. Uh, we have seen that with Mark Zuckerberg, but we've seen that with other uh, tech giants, that it is okay to give a fine, but it is absolutely not sufficient. They don't listen. The, the latest thing what they did was uh, to try to fight against fake news by making it impossible, for example, to have pan-European campaigns. All these candidates here have not the possibility now to make advertisement on Facebook to reach out to all the people in Europe who are using Facebook. So I think we need to take in our own hands this regulation and not to believe in the so-called auto regulation. Okay. You remember that in yes. the financial sector there was exactly. also... You remember the time is up as well. Okay. So your point is well made. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Tomic, what is your point of view on this issue? Regulations and fines. Yes, thank you for the question. I understand that for young people this is extremely important issue and for all of us. When I was young, we didn't have any computers and one prototype was big as a classroom. Now everybody has his own mobile phone, but even though your generation is the first generation after Second World War who lives worse than their parents. And here I come to my point that all corporations like Google, Amazon and, uh, uh, and Facebook should pay taxes in the countries where they operate, like GAFA tax, because these funds will be needed to welfare state, to education and also to transition to green technology. So we have to abolish all tax havens for all corporations and make a fair taxation for all. As a follow-up question to you, now there's been a lot of discussion on the new copyright directive that the EU has adopted. Now you've been an artist yourself. What is your opinion on this new directive? Will it limit freedom of speech or will it protect performers and artists like yourself? Well, uh, European left strictly votes against this legislation, which was uh, 
uh, on, the, on the table now, but we are quite sure that uh, everybody must have the free access of internet and knowledge is knowledge for everyone and we cannot protect uh, from the richest people that other cannot give, get the, the right information. Baz Eichhardt, where do you stand on bigger fines and newer regulations? Regulate very clearly. I mean, the digital uh, agenda, the digital future is there and it's giving a lot of opportunities, but clearly it needs to be regulated. Otherwise, what you will have is data monopolists. And I think there, I don't agree with uh, Mr. Zaradil that we are on the right track. For example, in competition policies, we cannot still look at the, the position of data which is, of course, centred to a couple of com uh, com companies. So they need to be regulated. We want to make sure that those companies are delivering services to the people instead of what they're doing now is making profit over data. And that needs to change. Indeed, on data protection, by the way, Green Rapporteur, he delivered to make sure that at least our data is better protected. This was very much lobbied against by Facebook, but now they have to follow the European rules. They are now claiming that it should be global. And this shows you the power of European regulation. They don't want it, but once they have to comply, they know it's better to make it a global standard. And that's where Europe can be strong. Now, one of the other areas where we know there's a problem is that a lot of these big companies do not pay their fair share of taxes. Occasionally, not at all. You have been very strong as the Greens on clamping down on tax evasion, but how are you actually going to do it? How are you going to convince national governments to make a collective effort, or how are you going to somehow change the EU's powers so that you can take Well, action? this is about future EU powers, and this is where EU at the moment is lacking powers. Yes, but how? Tell us how. Yes, so how? This is exactly where a campaign is for, that people do realise that you need to strengthen Europe in order to give them the possibility to tax companies. What is happening now is that countries are just competing against each other to offer the lowest rate of taxation on companies. This needs to be European power in order to make sure that every company, and certainly tech companies, are paying their fair share of taxation. And how this means in every country, we need to make sure that they are convinced and the people are convinced that this is the only way to treat and to tackle okay. the company. Moving power. on now. Yes, moving on. Frans Timmermans, for you the same question. You know, these things, these things are really amazing. Uh, it gives me the opportunity to stay in touch with my family when I'm traveling and campaigning. I can share pictures uh, on social media, and uh, we have uh, all these selfies, and we use them all the time. Amazing. At the same time, there's a downside. These tech companies use the data you give them for free, and they make billions of profits with them. So we need urgently to do a few things. First of all, we need to make sure that your data remain your data and that you know, if you want to share the data, that you can market it or you can give it away for free, but that you know that you're helping them make billions of profits. And then these billions of profits aren't even taxed. So we have a serious problem on two levels. First of all, data is a new production factor in the economy, and it needs to be owned by you, because it's yours. Secondly, we need to tax these big tech companies because they're making billions and billions of profits and they're not paying any tax apart from a small amount of tax in the United States. You need to tax them where they make the profits, that's here, and you need Europe to do that. Now you... <laughs> you probably see this question coming, but you are a commissioner, you're vice president, uh, so what happened that you didn't do this already? And second, maybe, what was the compromise that you may have to make on this topic? What was the most difficult compromise? Well, first of all, if you make me out all powerful, I'll make sure I'll do it immediately. But this is something where we need co-legislators, and here member states have been extremely reluctant. We've had a lot of support from the European Parliament. The European Parliament was very supportive of the Commission in this area. GDPR, the protection of your data, was something really the European Parliament pushed for together with us, and reluctantly the member states exactly. accepted. Exactly. But on taxation, they're completely obsessed with taxation. But by now we know they don't have the power individually anymore to control these big tech companies. They're arm-twisted into granting them tax-free access to their economy. Only Europe can stop that, and I think we need to convince our member states to give us the power mm -hmm. to Thank do that you. immediately. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have now a specific question also for you. You may also use the opportunity to react if you want. But the specific question has to do with uh, what we call the lobbyist that normally calls the politician. Now, 
you and Facebook's chief lobbyist uh, Nick Clegg, from Mr. Hofstadt indeed, you are both long-time liberals. Will you call him in your first days as commission president? And what changes from Facebook would you demand from him? Well, I have to tell you that I have already called him <laughs> the last week about the question that I raised here, the impossibility to have a, a pan-European campaign on Facebook. Mm -hmm. But it's completely in contradiction with the European uh, democracy. And my second point is the best way to tackle Facebook is to have an own European Facebook the fastest as possible, because I agree with all the measures that have been proposed uh, by France and by Bas Ecot, uh, not, not by you, Mr. Zagardin, not by you, but <laughs> with, with, with the others. So I, I, I agree Very with close. all these proposals, okay. but may I show you what the real problem is? The real problem is this little chart that you see. You see red balloons? That are the American platforms. You see the blue balloons? Maybe the, the color is not white. <laughs> yeah. uh, that are the Chinese and the Asian. And where are the Europeans? That's only the little yellow balloon in the middle. So the problem is there. If we create one standard in Europe, one regulator, we will create also our own Facebook, our own Google, our Thank own you very Amazon. Much, Mr. And that's the way to go so forward. We now have to turn directly to Violeta Tomic. Ms. Tomic, you're from an anti-capitalist party, and while it's easy to criticize capitalism and all of the problems in our globalized, digitized economy, Europeans also need to know from you, where will the jobs come from if we instead tax and regulate and turn away from the innovation that often comes from these big tech companies? Yes, thank you for the question. Uh, the jobs are, must come because uh, the, the full employment must be taken into the concern. But uh, we will create them like uh, we propose uh, the Green New Deal for, you, for Europe, like uh, uh, the, some prosperity forces in USA. So Green New Deal will create jobs and also the green technology as well as uh, green energy and invest in the, in the power and solar, uh, wind and solar power plants and uh, we should build a common railway connections, fast railways all around the Europe. So it will create a lot of jobs and finally we will end the air of austerity and depression in Europe because Europe doesn't need austerity, it needs investments. Question for you, Mr. Eikhout. One of the key benefits of the digital revolution is actually transparency. But it's also very easy to abuse digital tools. And we've seen that also. And we would like to know from you whether you think that platforms such as WikiLeaks are, are a hero or actually a villain. And whether you think that, that that should be more regulated than it's currently the case. I would say they are heroes because they provide transparency. And transparency is here key. Also to fight, for example, fake news. We should not be a politician regulating what is fake news and what is not, because then, as a politician, you are deciding what is true or not. That's absolutely the wrong direction. But we need to make sure that there is transparency. Who is funding? Who is making sure that everything is uh, paid And how will for? you do that, then? How will you make sure that there's, there's no can, abuse of these digital tools? But you can regulate those companies. They want to be on the European market. They love to be on the European market. We have half a billion of rich consumers in the European market. They want to make sure that they deliver their data. Well, then they may need to make sure that they are also playing according to the European rules. And here, it's just very simple. We have to put in the rules so that it's very clear that there is full transparency on any of the advertisement, and that is how to tell also fake news, for example. Can I just challenge one two seconds? On, yeah, I'm challenge on Mr. Verhofstadt because he's always very much into investment, investment. But really, I cannot see that going together with the liberals have been pushing for an austerity agenda over the last five years on everything. It's always so easy in campaign time to say okay. we need investment, but how oh. do you rhyme that with your austerity agenda coming from Germany, Netherlands, Maybe because, Denmark, because, 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 because for the simple.
because for the simple reason that, in my opinion, it is not the public authority who have to create uh, these internet platforms. You are talking about public investment. Public investment is needed in roads. Public investment is needed in and not in digital public, infrastructure, in, in public transport. Digital but is this, in my opinion, not needed? It's not to the public authorities to start an internet business and to start Google. Can you imagine that it is uh, the Dutch government or the Belgian government <laughs> to talk about? Or the European <laughs> government? <laughs> who will say, okay, I am sitting here and that is a load and that not, that we will invest. No, the problem is totally different. And that nobody of you have tackled on this moment. Okay, that was you, fun, no, but your time sorry, is up. We're turning sorry, to Franz Ryan. Timmermans. If no, I'm turning to Franz Timmermans. Make, We're running this debate, not okay. you, Mr. Hofstadt. Franz Timmermans. Well done. The EU is the world's leading tech regulator, but the bulk of jobs come from innovation, not from regulator and agencies. Um, so on the jobs front, shouldn't the EU and wouldn't you consider something like an EU-wide startup visa to attract more entrepreneurs and innovation to Europe? Well, I think the access to investment, to money, uh, has already been improved over the last couple of years. We, do, we need to do much more because there are so many ideas in Europe coming up from so many young people. We need to give them the capacity to invest, to have startups, to connect with others. I don't believe in this sort of protectionism idea for Hofstadt to start your own Facebook in Europe. Let platforms work worldwide, but show that we have new things to add to all of this. Show that, for instance, if we introduce 5G in our cities, we can reduce carbon emissions radically because we change radically the way uh, we organize mobility. Show that these investments lead to a more sustainable Europe. Show the rest of the world that if they follow our example, we can make it a, a carbon neutral EU by 2050. These are the things that digital world should help us with. And, and also, we shouldn't be naive. The Russians are trying to exploit this through their bot factories everywhere, to create fake news, to influence our elections. They'll do it again in the European elections. And we need to be alert. We need to protect our citizens against this interference Thank from you. abroad. Thank you very much. We now turn to you. We turn to you. Mr. Saradil, one of our master's university students, who's named Daniele Bereni from Italy, asks about taxation of digital companies. And she wants to know what is a fair tax rate for digital companies to pay, in your view? Well, I have no upper limit, no lower limit. And I think that the question of taxation... Isn't zero a little bit too <laughs> no. low? I think that the question you of taxation is very... Uh, it's, it's a very illustrative because it gives us a clear answer where we differentiate. I don't think that taxation, whatever taxation, should be a matter for European Union or European Commission. I still believe that European Union is not a state, therefore it should not tax businesses. It is upon national governments to tax businesses because they are states. And I think that European Union should not turn into state. I even don't believe that European Union should create some own tax resources. I still believe that European budget should be dependent on contributions from member states. So what I believe is that those uh, tech companies, those big guys, should be taxed, should be taxed properly, but should be taxed on the level of national states right. and not but on the level of the European Union. Um, mm -hmm. No, I think we're running behind time. So. Uh, yeah, but this whoa, is important. what a, what yeah. a pity. <laughs> so I would say, why don't we just introduce a corporate tax of minimum 18% in the whole of the European Union, that nobody can go ahead and tax companies with zero tax. Okay, they can well, the way we can manage that, we've got a proposal. I'm going to ask you all to put your hands up. Would principle. you support a minimum tax rate of 18%, a corporate minimum tax rate common across Europe? Hands up who supports that idea. I would have loved that proposal already okay. this five years. Can I launch a counter-proposal? No, you can't because we're running behind time. No. So, I am strict We're going against. to turn now I to know. our first question from one of our audience members. But before we do that, I want to remind you to go to slido.com and vote to say who you think is winning in the debate so far. Indeed, indeed. It is still Frans Timmermans on top, Bas Eikhout following. Not so much changing yet from the first. Uh, no. I think let's, see, let's see if an audience question changes that. I think the audience should. should, should Continue using their devices. <laughs> we are now going to a question actually from a YouTube influencer. And he's in the audience. He is from Poland. His name is Rafał Mani. And he also wants to pose a question to <clears throat> you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to ask you not what to do or how we should do it, but how to communicate about what's happening. 
the EU is facing an image crisis and uh, the Eurosceptic debate is on the rise, especially online. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, you know, people can and should debate whatever they want. But on the other hand, we have uh, fake news on the rise and Brexit is in part the result of this. So I think that announcing an EU decision is one thing, but really communicating, explaining it to the people, especially to young people, you know, proudly addicted to their phones, is another big challenge. So my question is, how will you implement an effective and long-term communication plan for EU citizens? Thank you for that question, Rafael. We'll start with you, Violeta Tomic. Thank you for the question. Probably we have to introduce the fake news scale, which can we measure if it is really fake or it is <laughs> half fake. Because, <laughs> because now the lies are spreading around and fake news are producing a lot of hate speech. And I agree, the, the Brexit is the result of this. And uh, I'm afraid the rising of far-right ideas are very much supported with this Islamophobia, homophobia and other hatred which are spreading around the internet. Uh, but uh, the case of Cambridge Analytics uh, has clearly shown that uh, using our collecting data is also weapons. Weapons uh, in politics today uh, that already means uh, mass control and influence of public opinion, and also they can, can manipulate with mass. Thank you, Mr. Mitch. <laughs> boss, then we turn to you, Boss Eiko. Do, do you agree? Respond. Uh, not Thomas. entirely, not entirely, because I'm a bit, I always get a bit nervous when people say we need to de make a scale of, of fake news and half fake news. Who's going to do that? Who's going to judge? Who's going to determine? I'm not naive, but I am saying you that it needs to be very important that politicians cannot judge on the scale of what is fake news. What is important here, and that is really to the citizens, is to make sure that there is full transparency. And when there is hate speech, it's not allowed. Get them, because hate speech is not allowed in traditional media and not in a but new media. To answer, media. Rafael, what is your communication strategy? Our communication strategy is very clearly to make sure that people start to understand how social media works. That is very important. Provide transparency, provide also people that they get used to working with social media. That is very important. And regulate it, make sure that the protection of data and that the data power is broken by these monopolists. That is important. You can tackle it, but you can't tackle or judge as a politician what is fake news. Your turn, Mr. Timmermans. Well, if, if, you're, if you're a newspaper, a new, news broadcaster, you're liable if you lie, if you uh, spread fake news, if you um, uh, incite hatred. So why aren't the platforms on the same level? I think this is the first thing we need to do in regulation. But the honest answer to Rafael's question is education, education, education. We need to help people to understand of a young age to discern fake from real. Because the one thing that threatens our society is that we lose the capacity of critical thinking. And then obscurantism gets a new role. Obscuritism that is passed on through the social media, through uh, the networks. And the only answer to that is education. Teach our children critical thinking. And that is also a responsibility of everyone in this room. You're all highly educated. Use that. You have a responsibility towards others in society to do that. That's the only way forward. And Poland is a case in point. After all the hatred I got from the Polish government over the last three years, the support for the EU in Poland today is higher than three Thank years ago. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Saradil, what is your answer? What is your effective communication strategy? And will you and your party be the next influencer, I, as is done by the youth, through yeah, YouTube? I, name it. I take the point. Uh, <laughs> look, guys, I have been living uh, in the communist regi regime for the first 26 years, 
of my life. And every day we have been exposed to fake news coming from Russia. Somehow, subconsciously, we have been able to differentiate what is right, what is wrong. We knew that where they were lying to us, we survived and we were able to separate the lie from at least some partial truth. So, I don't believe, I firmly don't believe that any above design communication strategy would work. I know that young people would be somehow distant to that and they simply wouldn't trust authorities if there is something imposed on them and I have a very strong belief and firm belief into you and into your ability, into your common sense and into that you are able to differentiate fake news from reality. You have enormous space, the internet and everything in this digital space is enormous chance, so use it and I believe that you can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The final word goes to you, Mr. Verhofstadt. No, I believe, uh, as is the case, uh, uh, with, uh, with Frans Timmermans, very much in, in the ability of, of individual people uh, to judge that. But they have to have the capacity to do so. Uh, today, what is the reality? The reality is that uh, more or less 24,000 scrutineers are uh, in Facebook in India looking to the, our pages and saying, this is allowed and this is not allowed. But who is Mark Zuckerberg and his Facebook that he has the power to do so, while this is in fact a task for public uh, authorities to do so? So we need, uh, besides that, a regulation on what specific thing? That's on the algorithms, Mr. Sargodil. The algorithms that Facebook is using uh, are making that people are always saying the same thing. So they see one thing of fake news, they been offered a second thing of fake news, a third thing of fake news. So these algorithms need to be regulated as fast as possible. And then the third thing, and I say it to Bas Eckert, who don't like liberalism, I've understood, uh, in any way, we need competition. If you have different choices next to Facebook, then people can judge and can choose. Thank you, Mr. Verhofstadt. <laughs> That brings us to the end of our first section. I think because we're a little behind time, yes. we'll go straight into the second section. Yes, we go straight into a sustainable Europe. The EU claims to be a leader on climate action. Yet in many member states, there are problems with putting these goals into practice. In 2017, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and Al Gore were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for their efforts to increase awareness about man-made climate change. Two years later, Greta Thunberg, the 16-year-old Swedish activist who started the Youth for Climate movement, was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. In March 2019, young people around the world took to the streets to demand political action to cut emissions and fight rising temperatures. Without a long-term strategy on climate change, national regulators worry that banks are leaving themselves open to financial risk. The European Investment Plan, launched in 2017, contributes to sustainable development, growth and jobs, while also tackling the root causes of migration. But the plan has been criticised for its lack of focus on sustainable development and poverty reduction. National lawmakers across Europe fear a backlash if they move too far or too fast. How can the EU successfully integrate sustainability into its financial policy? And how can the EU balance economic interests with climate needs and sustainable development? Now, EU surveys consistently show that most Europeans believe that the EU needs to take a strong role in both climate and environmental action. It's not something to be left to the lower levels of government or public policy. That's especially true of the opinions of young Europeans. So let's start with a relevant hands-up question in that regard. Each of you, raise your hand if you support the student climate strikers. We've got four out of five. Okay. Now here's the hard question, and you don't get to answer, Mr. Zaradil, because it won't be relevant to you. What are you going to do about supporting them if you become Commission President? Because it's a follow-up question, we give you 30 seconds only for your answer. And the first person to answer is Guy Verhofstadt. I, I think that uh, we need to go from uh, the defensive way we look to climate change to a more offensive way. And that is based, in my opinion, on, on, on two different uh, strategies. The first is uh, to put environmental standards in our trade negotiations. I don't think that we need to go forward with a, a trade deal when a country is saying, oh, the Paris uh, Agreement doesn't exist. And second, to invest in these specific uh, activities for the future, batteries, or, for example, if I can give an, uh, this example... Three seconds. Okay, I will wait for the next <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Violeta Tomic, your turn. Thank you. I saw a very uh, emotional speech of Greta in European Parliament and I couldn't agree more. Our house is falling apart and the time just for cosmetic changes is passed away, it's finished. Now we have to act. We have to act very, very quickly and you have to make a plan how to battle the biggest crisis of 21st century because now it is humanity which has to survive and we have to fight for it. Thank Straight you. to you, Baz Eikhardt. Well, first of all, we've got news because the Liberals in the European Parliament voted for negotiations with the United States who did not sign up or who is saying we want to get out of the Paris Agreement. So if Guy Verhofstadt is serious about his claim, then he will also make sure that those negotiations will not take place. So put the yeah. money where your mouth is. And this is... And this is exactly the problem. Everyone is talking about climate change, but we need to act on climate change. We need to keep the fossils in the ground, and this European Commission is still too much also giving subsidies to fossil fuel. Thank you. And that's you. one of the biggest problems. Frans Timmermans. As Commission President, I will take personal responsibility for the implementation of the 17 strategic develop sustainable development goals of the United Nations. This is the plan the world has developed at the highest level to get us to a sustainable world in 2030 and to make Europe carbon independent by 2050. So I will make every Commissioner responsible for part of the 17 SDGs and I will be personally accountable to the European Parliament and to the European Council for concrete results in the five years to come. We need to act now, we need to act quickly, no time to waste. Uh, you know, I would like to know why you didn't raise your hand. Well, so you get also 30 seconds. Because there's a lot of, <laughs> lot of strong words, a lot of strong verbal commitments, but we haven't fulfilled our commitments already done. We are still putting ahead of us new commitments, zero carbon until 2050. I think that we have to act realistically. We have to phase out, for instance, coal burning. If we talk sustainable, let's talk sustainable. We have to phase out coal burning in a sustainable way because some economies, and particularly economies of Central and Eastern European countries, are not ready for that. And Thank if you, you phase it out from one day to another, this you will you very much. Time for the next an hands up damage We've that got another it will item lead to here. a great suffering. We've got another use item here that now ECR is also for finally tackling coal, which, for example, the biggest group in ECR the Polish PIS party has always no, voted no, no, against no. any no. action against coal. So here again, beautiful words on the stage, but no. when they start no. voting, they have don't... Because it's not a direct react. attack on you, Mr. No. Zaradil, I won't give the right. I have we're, to we're, going, to we're going to turn now to our next question from the audience. We have a question from the president of the European Youth Forum, Karina Altengruber. Thank you very much. Um, young people have more at stake in terms of decisions relating to the protection of our planet and future, yet we have very little possibilities of actually influencing those decisions. And achieving sustainable development is not possible if we do not address rising poverty, social exclusion and discrimination that young people face in Europe. So my question to the candidates is, what concrete measures will you put into practice to ensure that sustainable development, the Paris Agreement, and future generations are at the centre of all European policies? Thank you, Karina. And the floor is yours, Bas Eikhout. First of all, climate change action is a social and economic action, so it needs to be in the hand of the President of the Commission. So when I'm President of the European Commission, I will make sure I will take the lead on climate action. And climate action needs, means investments, investments in new jobs, investments in a new economy, investments in every sector. Think, of, for example, about our transport sector. It's because now we have put in place CO2 standards on cars that even a CEO from Volkswagen is acknowledging that maybe they should change their tactics and go for e-mobility. This shows you that the new future jobs for all of us will be there if we put in the tough standards standards and stuff, tough regulation on every sector and how to meet, make that central because the President of the European Commission should for once take action of the SDGs and climate change and don't leave it to one of the commissioners. Mr. Timmermans, it sounds like you um, already well, pre-answered that thank question. You, thank you, Bas, for that support. That's a good, a good idea. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at the voting patterns in the European Parliament over the last five years, three parties standing here together are really on the green side. 
you're a bit in the middle, uh, you're in the red zone with the dinosaurs, but, <laughs> but, but Mr. Weber and his EPP is even beyond, be, uh, behind you. So you know, th those are the results over the last five years. Um, so the first thing you need to do is to go and vote. Go vote green. Uh, and these three parties... <laughs> headline news tonight. <laughs> yes, green is not the sole property of the Green Party. Green is what the unified left does, what we do, and we will do it together. We are not in a competition here. This is not a beauty contest. This is about your future, and we will need to do this together. And if we do this together, I sort of hope we get the Liberals on board as well. And then we might have a majority in the European Parliament that is for a Green yeah, Deal. Majority. And then we really get things done. Thank okay. you very much, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Sarado, I think you want to react to yeah, Mr. I Timmermans. Always, I always liked Jurassic Park, so I don't mind to be called <laughs> a dinosaur. Uh, the thing is, the thing is uh, that if we go too fast, we will not help the young generation from the trap of some disadvantage at the market. That's very clear. I was talking sustainable, and I think that we have to come out with some sustainable solutions that will not damage our economy, that will not come up with economic disaster, and that will not rise up the poverty. Look at what happened in France, where President Macron came just with a small tax on fuel, and this was unsustainable, uh, unbearable for certain social groups, for certain age groups, yeah, and they started they to protect, because first. that was done in a pretty, that was done in a pretty unsustainable way. So we have to choose right timetable, and we must not threaten and endanger our economies while sticking with the Paris Climate Agreement. But I consider this zero carbon economy until 2050, excuse me, pretty Thank unrealistic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Know, if you if you do now, what Macron Mr. did, if you do what Macron we come did, to you. first lower the taxes for rich people and then tax people with average or lower incomes, you're bound to get protests from society. That was the wrong decision. Just yes, but you've Mr. also Macron. had your turn on this question. Mr. Verhofstadt. Yeah, first, I'm very pleased that everybody is saying, yeah, if the Liberals are on board, then things will happen. I think that's... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I think it's quite true because in the last uh, years, uh, and France has seen it, and Buzz also, Buzz echoed. Every time when all these CO2 emission reductions have been voted, it was with the support of the Liberals, because otherwise there was no majority yes. in the European Parliament. So yes. let's be honest about this, and I hope that you can recognize it, sure. that this uh, Liberal group, and that will to, to, tomorrow be far more the case. That's the reason why I said, Buzz, that's the reason why I said, well, wait a little bit, that it is necessary for a trade deal also to include the Paris Climate Agreement. And second, my second point is we need Need to be more concrete. For example, European champions in sustainability that we need to create. We cannot create maybe them in internet, but in sustainability. For example, in batteries. For example, in public transport. For example, in environmental meat. It is this university, the Maastricht University, who have invented with Mark Post, Professor Mark Post, environmental meat. Let's I've, create Mr. an Mark industry said, got one from Maastricht starting. I should say. If you think Paris climate agreement should be in trade deals, does that mean no US trade deal until well, uh, in the agreement? Well, uh, our new party, in, uh, as you know, yes we no? have an agreement. Yes, yes, or no? yes or no? The, the answer is yes, I said it already. Great. In Excellent. The beginning Good. Of the okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> we go to Ms. Tomic. What are your concrete actions to the question of Karina. So please also be concrete. That's yes. what our audience uh, likes. Where we don't agree with neoliberals is that uh, we don't believe that it is possible to have an environmental turnaround in neoliberal capitalism. Because it, because it follows just profits, not people and uh, environmental welfare. Because the European Commission is surrounded with 80,000 lobbyists which are working very hard that their voices are heard louder than people's voices. So we have to find the political will and power to change the system. This is the only solution. <laughs> oh, oh, revolution. Now, we return to specific questions. Franz Timmermans, I think you wanted to respond to some of the other candidates, and please do that. My specific question to you, though, is that Europe is proud of its climate targets, but with only 7% of the world's populations. How will you ensure that Europe isn't at a competitive disadvantage? Because Europe can't act on its own, really. It has to bring everyone else with it, otherwise it will be at a disadvantage. 
Yeah, because the rest of the world wants to be on the European market. We've seen it before. Every, whenever we uh, get, create higher environmental protection standards, higher social standards, parts of the economy say, don't do it, we'll lose our competitive uh, edge. The opposite is true. Higher standards means better competitiveness, means that the rest of the world wants to abide by your standards. We, we came up, and BUS helped me greatly on this, we came up with a plastic strategy that is unique in the world, and it's something other parts of the world are going to copy. We're going to reduce single-use plastics in the oceans by 70%. It starts in Europe, but it has a huge effect on the rest of the world if we take the lead. And if we don't take the lead, nobody will, because there's a man in Washington who's trying to break all this. And only a united Europe can stop Trump and his idiocy on climate change and on the environment. Strong words. Mr. Zaradil, now meeting Europe's climate targets will require major industrial changes. Now, you didn't raise your hand when we asked whether you support the climate strikers, but we do want to know how are you going to deal with the climate challenge that we have? Coal mines closing, car factories going electric, but you apparently want to cut old rules and freeze new ones. So how can we reduce new urgent climate pressure if you tie your hands behind one back? Well, again, European Commission has two basic instruments how it could assist and help member states to tackle problems. One is legislation, the other one is budget. I think that when it comes to legislation, we have, our, we have made our deal, we have made our portion. When it comes to money from European budget, we have a couple of programs in the, first, uh, in the next multi-annual financial framework. We have an uh, innovation program, so-called Horizon Europe, uh, 100 billion of euros over the course of seven years, uh, which will help. We have a program called InvestEU, which is somehow repackaged Juncker's plan with 60, 650 billion of euros over the course of uh, seven years, investing to new technologies, uh, retraining, new skills, also digital economy, innovation. So I think that within the range of the European budget, there are good plans and we should stick with them. Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to you, Mr. Verhofstadt, now. Uh, your ally, Emmanuel Macron, has said there is no planet B. But his fuel tax plan was a disaster both for him politically and for the rural French. Do you reject the idea of fuel taxes as part of your climate action strategy? Oh, uh, he recognized that, first of all, that he made a mistake. And I think that's a great thing for Emmanuel Macron, that in the, in, the, in the big debate in France, he had recognized that he wanted to go maybe uh, too fast. But what we are backing, uh, for example, is certainly that one of the new income uh, for the European Union uh, is uh, a carbon. A carbon tax that goes directly to the European Union and is not, first of all, uh, being uh, sent, I should say, to the member states, uh, as is the system uh, today. And the second thing, what we need to do with that money is uh, the fastest as possible to investments in new sustainable programs. I already give the battery. We have an enormous uh, uh, car industry, but we have no common battery for it. We have, for example, meat, you know, that cows and animals are uh, the source for 14% of the CO2 emissions. If we can have environmental meat, that would be a solution. Then public transport. So concrete proposals and money of the carbon tax going in these concrete proposals. Thank you very much. Now, Ms. Tomic, I was listening to one of the interviews that you gave previously and where you mentioned that you consider yourself to be an eco-socialist. But what about your voters? Are they actually willing to cut public funds to coal mines and to oil pipelines and car manufacturers and all the job losses that that might cost uh, in the name of the environment? Well, they will not lose the jobs because we will have transition to green economy and new jobs which will be created would be green. But it's not a direct transfer between no. those people in those manufacturing and traditional industries moving into some beautiful but new tech industry. It is not direct transfer, but we have to invest in green new jobs, in green technology. Then transfer will come slowly, but we will find our goal once. Uh, me personally, I was working in my parliament on hemp production, for example. It can replace plastic 
widely. But uh, corporations have no interest, so it is f that's why it is forbidden in many countries. But hemp is a plant which can be used in 50,000 uh, products, and it is completely ecology and friendly. Thank you, Ms. Tomic. <laughs> Finally, to you, Bazai Count. It's very easy to say that the cost of inaction is higher than the cost of action, but where will you get the money to fund all of the actions that the Greens want to take on climate? Well, first of all, it's true that the cost of inaction are higher, so it's not only easy, it's also the truth, and I think that should be said as well. What, where the investments come from, this is about making sure that the polluter pays. And let's be very honest, we are all saying that, that Europe is doing fine, but for example, currently the big polluters get their allowances for free. They get an allowance to pollute. So the prices that are currently for carbon are way too low. So if they are too low, you don't have the revenues to invest. This is very simple. You need to make sure that the price for pollution is there of the ones who pollute. And that is our solution. And I just have to say there that your question at the beginning saying, well, you know, you have green, but what about the jobs? Sorry, if we don't do green policies, we will not have the jobs. The only way to have the jobs of the future is to make credible and very, very ambitious climate policies because then the jobs will be here. Otherwise, we will be importing cars from China instead of producing them here. And that's the way to create green jobs. Thank you. Now, this already takes us to the end of the second theme. Time is flying this evening, unfortunately, so we have to move on. So we have been listening now to the candidates' view on digital policies, on sustainability. Let's see what our viewers are actually thinking of your performance here tonight. Let's see. Oh, Ryan. that is good news for Franz Timmermans. You've jumped up to 44%, but Baz Eickhout, that is a bit of a breakout performance compared to the overall vote level that the Green Party has in Europe. Uh, and I think that there's a bit of work to do for Guy Verhofstadt. I think Young Obama would say uh, we are punching above our weight. I think. Well, that's yeah. typical amongst a youth demographic, so probably there's a bit of a match there considering yeah. who might be watching. But it is true you are one of the smaller parties, so take the compliment. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> now time to move to our third section on the future of Europe. <laughs> the continent is facing a period of uncertainty. Inequality is rising. Trust in political parties and public institutions is declining. The United Kingdom has voted to leave the European Union. For the fourth year in a row, immigration tops the list of voter concerns in 22 European countries. Populist movements on both sides of the spectrum have grown. In the last European election, only 28% of people under the age of 25 voted, and just 2% of current MEPs are below the age of 30. This leaves young people underrepresented in European politics, and their concerns low on the priority list. Women currently make up 36% of the European Parliament, and only 7 of the 28 European Commissioners. This raises a number of questions about the future of the European Union. What opportunities should the EU guarantee for this new generation of Europeans? Do critics, skeptics and nationalists have a point about its flaws? Okay, we're going to start with a hands-up question. I promised you to come back to the gender topic, eh? so I'm doing that now. You see there's only one woman on stage, and yet Europe is 50% female. And as president, you have the power to propose your team of commissioners. So here comes the hand up question. Do you commit to selecting a gender equal team of commissioners? Raise your hand if it's yes. Okay, we have that. Uh, I think I can do this. So this has been taped, eh? this is now on the record. Eh? So we will not... That problem uh, is solved already. Very good. We, we committed now, already in advance. That was the easy bit. That was very the much yeah. the easy bit, yeah. because how are you going to do that? That's what we really want to know. There was quite an inspirational proposal, I must say, from Sweden's foreign minister, uh, Margaret Wallström, who suggested that each candidate should actually nominate two candidates, a man and a woman. That is just one suggestion that you could, uh, you could follow. Now, you have 30 seconds to tell us how you are actually going to bring this promise that you just made to reality. Jan Zaradil, you begin. Well, I think actually this is a very good 
proposal uh, that each state, each government should come with uh, uh, equal uh, pair of candidates. And then, of course, I firmly believe that there will be enough female candidates that will be uh, good, that will, that will have good expertise, that will be eligible for the job. So if it goes this way, I think that we can easily solve this problem. Thank you. Guy Verhofstadt, what's your uh, view on this? Uh, it's, it's true, and the, the proposal is the best proposal you can have, that every country has to come forward with two candidates. The question is how you oblige the member states to do so. I think we have a weapon as European Parliament, and we have to do the hearings. And at the end of the hearings, we have to adopt the whole commission. We could say, as Parliament, we don't start the hearings and there will never be an acceptation of your commission if all the member states are not committing to have two okay. candidates, female and male. Violetta Turner. European left uh, is, in European Parliament, the only parliamentary group which has the similar number of men and women. And it was not... It just happens, and also the leading candidates, we have two, Nico Kue and me. So we don't want to fight for quotas, because in left we have equal rights. But this proposal for the European commissioners, it seems good for me. Thank you. <laughs> Very clear. That's well, well, first of all, practice what you preach, and also we as Greens have two Spitzenkandidaten, so we have two lead candidates, a man and a woman, and Ska Keller, they will, she will be there in Florence and Brussels doing the other two debates. So that's first. Like Secondly, you. as a president of the European Commission, you have a power towards the countries. Indeed, you force them to come up with two candidates, but also make very clear, if they want to have a good position in the European Commission, they need to deliver on female candidates because I, as a president of the European Commission, will only hand out the good positions to female <laughs> candidates. Fighting words, Franz Timmermans, can you match it? Did I, did I mention Pedro Sanchez already tonight? Yeah. I think I did. Huh? Yeah. 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 Let me mention him again. He did talk about quota, but when he came with the government, there were more women in it than men, and they are all high quality. So the danger of quota is that you don't get the stigma. As woman, you're in there because of a quota, not because of your quality. So I don't like the idea of quota. Do, don't tell, just do. And I, and Boss is absolutely right. The president of the commission can arm twist a member state to come up with a good female candidate. And in response to that, he can give that candidate a very good portfolio. And Parliament can also Thank you play. very I, much. I would say I, I agree with you. Thank you very Parliament, much. Parliament, Parliament there's a lot of men speaking, speaking yeah. but there's a female yes. moderator. And when the rector speaks, eh, when the no, rector no, no. speaks, we agree on something. everyone stops. Eh? We agree on something. I'm with him. <laughs> no, but I think, I think, Ryan, what we've just seen here is history being made. Yeah, because all our candidates on live streaming in the full audience have committed themselves to having a gender-balanced Commission. So Let's thank see you if very Manfred much Weber is tweeting at home. I so he said it. Oh yeah, we missed one. To him. <laughs> no, to be fair to him, he's also said 50-50. Yes, he has. Okay. He has. That well, is. We that have, is. have them all on board. That's very working. generous of you, uh, Mr. Timmermans. No, credit. I believe we have to defend ourselves. Now, a general question for you all. We're going to move on. You have female uh, commissioner. Uh, we have. No, no, no. We're moving on with the debate. Back over here. Now, if I've done my homework correctly, each of you earns between 3,500 and 23,000 euros per month before taxes. Most young people in Europe earn less than 1,500 euros per month, if they have a job at all. So my question is, what will your version of Europe do for young people with an insecure or low-paid job, or no job at all? No blah blah here, just be honest. And tell us also if you think it's not the EU's job to solve this problem. Kiva Hofstadt, you go first. Well, I think that we have to, to do two specific things. I, increase the uh, labour mobility in, in Europe. You know, the labour mobility in Europe is only 1%. So at the end of the year, only 1% of the people are working in another country than where they started. In the US, for example, it's 10%. So, and I have today, we need to increase this labour mobility because there are 3 million vacancies inside Europe. So it's the first thing to do. And the second thing to do, I believe also, and I'm a liberal, so it's not easy to tell that, and certainly not uh, when we were criticised about it. Also for a social Europe, I think there is also a social policy that needs to be done by the European Union. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he has nearly a heart attack now, so... Uh, be careful, be, be careful. Aware, uh, for France. And that is to have this minimum 
social security level. That has to be the same in all the countries of the European Union, because otherwise there will be never, never the security for these young people, and so this labour mobility cannot be increased. So that social pillar needs to be built, and that is set by liberal friends. Violetta Tomé. We're going to make a new group, as you know. We will be both. You're very close to each other. Well, but you're in the middle, has, boss. That's very good. He hasn't talked to Mark Rutte yet. Oh. Uh, <laughs> but now but, we uh, my, my, my but proposal careful, is that he does it self because he will be the candidate so. of Mark Rutte. But now <laughs> we will go to Violetta Tomic. Please, your turn. Yes, it is a shame for European Union that it is hiding 120 20 millions of uh, poor people and 21 million of unemployed. Most of them are young people. It is very, very bad start for your career and for your family life if you have no access to proper jobs and to, to normal housing. So that's why we have to really take care of full employment and uh, the minimum wage, which will be 20% over the minimum uh, costs of each country, and social insurance, pension insurance, we have to make a welfare state for all. And ECB should take into a concern full employment, not just inflation and euro. Baz Eichardt, that, Baz, that was a very concrete proposal from Violeta Tomic. Uh, what do you think about that, and what else would you do to support those young people? I agree here. Uh, I'm also a bit uh, surprised, to be very honest, that, that this is a bit maybe confusing for, for people in the audience, that every time when we are discussing we seem to agree, although this is exactly a topic where the current European Union did not deliver. Mm -hmm. Why is there no proposal for a minimum wage at the European level? It did not come from the European Commission, the Liberals have never seen proposals from them on that, and now suddenly we are supporting it. Why is there still possibility not to pay your interns? Also there we can make regulation, has not been proposed. <laughs> Would you make so those, that a are, those, are two, your... those are already two proposals. Third, room for investment. That means we need to change our austerity policies. That has always been imposed by the current status quo parties, and now they suddenly want to change it. Even Manfred Weber, he's not here, but otherwise he would have said, it's time for a new chapter. Sorry, guys, you've been writing this book now for I decades. Know. No. I know. It's okay. time okay. we have so a new no. I know. I know. But hey. You too, Mr. Mr. Bostad. So, Baz. Now it's time to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, you are probably not going to become commission president being you from the small party. You don't know. But that's not my point. My rising. point is, my point is that your votes could help elect that commission president. So would you make, as a condition for supporting someone to be commission president, uh, support for those sort of initiatives for you? Absolutely. Opinion? It's very clear for the Greens, and I said it in the introduction, a green agenda needs to go hand in hand with social justice and a social agenda. And for the Greens, it's very clearly the new European Commission finally needs to deliver on green and social issues going hand in hand. And now we turn to Frans Timmermans, because you have been writing the book, yep. according to Bas. So yep. what's your answer and look, your look reaction? What, look what Stefan Löfven did, the Swedish Prime Minister. He came up with the idea of the social pillar, innovation. And we have already, thanks to the European Parliament, 24 legislative proposals have been adopted to make Europe more social. So we are moving, but not fast enough. I agree with Bas. We need a minimum wage in every European member state, which should be approximately 60% of the median wage. Then you can construct a, 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 a decent social system. But we all also need to understand that a 16-year-old person with a rucksack on his back, with Deliveroo letters on, is not an entrepreneur. Is somebody who deserves a decent contract, somebody who deserves social protection. And would it kill us, would it kill us to pay 50 cents more for a pizza so that we can be sure that people are protected when they do their jobs? No, it wouldn't. And these are the things we need to do in the next couple of years. We also need to have a fair taxation system and we need to restore the position of trade unions so that they neg can negotiate and bargain collective agreements so that salaries can go up and we can also solve the problem of Central Europe because salaries are far below what they should be Thank in Central Europe. Thank you. Perfect timing.
Mr. Zaradil, are you out on a limb on this Thank topic you. or are you going to agree? Thank you with very Al? much. Now, do you know what's the minimum wage here in the Netherlands? It's 1,600 euros per month. In my country, it's 500 euros. So the truth is that our economies are still very diverse. Our pension systems, our welfare systems, our social schemes are very diverse and they stem from different traditions, and it would be very unwise to try to harmonize them by force from above. Second thing is, and let's be again very honest, European Commission will not create jobs for you. European Commission can create atmosphere or can create conditions for in which jobs will grow. Do you know what's the unemployment in my country? It's less than 3%. It's the lowest in European Union because we have flexible single uh, labor market, we have flexible part-time jobs, and we introduced a good labor code, and I think that we should encourage member states to follow. And I don't think that it would help to come with a bigger redistribution. Thank we should... you okay. Thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Pick up on this. Two I, set, three I, seconds. I'd like to pick up on this because the cost of living in Central and Eastern Europe and Western Europe is not that far apart anymore. But the wages very often are only one third of Western Europe. Many times from Western European companies not paying decent salaries in Central and Eastern Europe. This needs to change. But for that to change, Eastern Europe, Central and Eastern Europe should let trade unions actually have some influence in society. Thank they have. have. No, no not they like like have. Hungary. Excuse me. Stop. Not yes. like in Hungary. My dear Hungary. candidates, dear candidates, we now go to the specific questions we have for each of you. We are really running out of time, so we are going to hurry a little bit. And I'll start with you, Ms. Tomic. Your party, the European Left, says on its website, and I quote, has been the only European parliamentary group systematically opposed to the European model of Maastricht. Oh, I was... <laughs> End of quote. Meaning the EU built around a single market, currency, political union. Now, we are here in Maastricht tonight in a reunited continent, an enlarged union, and during Europe's longest period of peace. Is it really so bad? Well, I'm very glad to have this debate in Maastricht, which is very famous on Maastricht rules, which is very strict about fiscal discipline, about austerity and everything, but not a word inside about social justice, uh, in full employment, welfare state, pensions, salaries, minimum salaries, nothing of it. So we think that this is the reason that far right is rising because they harvest success of these neoliberal policies and they collect the anger and frustration of all those people who have the feeling that neoliberal globalization is leaving them behind. That's why we need more justice, more social Europe, because if we want to save the Europe from itself, then we have to create more just social system, not one for the rich and another for the poor. Thank you. As I count, many Europeans say they worry about terrorism and security more than anything else. Do the Greens have anything to say to those voters? How can you make them be reassured or are you going to give up on their votes? Absolutely not. And what is the most important on security is that we need more cooperation. If you now look at the biggest problems when we are looking at terrorist attacks, quite often they were known, but they were not being communicated communicated to each other, or they could uh, run away to another country without even notifying each other. This is showing you where Europe is not delivering. Europe is not delivering on our security because we are not working together. We need more cooperation of the secret services in every national member state. That is one of the key proposals that we are putting forward, and that is one of the bigger problems. So we absolutely see why people don't th see European solutions. However, not providing then European cooperation is not the solution, and that's what the populists are saying. It doesn't deliver, so we want to go out. That's not the issue, because the terrorists are cross-border. They are moving around. They are communicating with each other. We need more cooperation at the European level to make sure that we are tackling also terrorism. Now, if I can Thanks. follow up on a slightly different topic, uh, the Greens are a very left-wing pro-EU party. Correct. Um, how far will you go to, to, stop, to stop Manfred Weber from the right wing becoming Commission President? This is really entirely to Manfred Weber himself. 
is he going to build a majority with the progressive parties that really want a different Europe that needs to deliver on democracy, green and social? Or is he going to continue the path that we unfortunately saw is that they are more and more working with the right? Well, I can say you one thing, one thing, and maybe this time I will not mention Sanchez in Spain, but I will mention the Partido Popular in Spain. They lost because they moved to the right, and the only thing that happened is making Vox bigger and making themselves smaller. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Mr. Timmermans, the EU's budget rules and bailout approaches have very mixed reviews, and for many they are considered far too harsh. Knowing what you know today, what would you do differently as president when it comes to the economy? What we need is to make sure that we convince Europeans to leave this fear for moral hazard behind. What I'm saying is this, Europeans today fear sharing their destiny with other Europeans because they believe other Europeans make abuse of that, make bad use of that. That is going to hold us back. And we need to have a debate of how we organize solidarity within societies because the difference between rich and poor in most of our societies has usually increased, which is undermining societies and which is helping the far right. And we need to make sure that, you have, that we have more solidarity at the European level. I, for instance, would be in favor of a fund funded by all member states that can come to the assistance of member states when they get into economic trouble so that they don't have to cut on social spending. That would make a huge and huge difference uh, in the European Union when a crisis occurs. I also believe we need euro bonds, not a popular point in this country, but it's much cheaper for the Dutch taxpayer to be in one group with one uh, 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 security than to leave member states on their own. They will be the prey of the financial markets. We've seen it with Greece. This should never Thank be you. repeated again. Thank you, Mr. Timmermans. Now, I have a follow-up on a slightly different topic, just like with Mr. Eichhout. Let's get practical for a second. Uh, your commission president, Donald Trump, tweets out that he's going to impose new car tariffs tomorrow. But he didn't call you or your trade commissioner. So who are you going to call and what are you going to do in response? I'm probably going to be on the next plane to Washington and see if I can see him. Um, and. Um, I will also make very clear that if we are united as Europeans, the way we retaliate will hurt them more than it will us. But the best thing is to do not to get there because we all get hurt if we go into protectionism. I think we have a huge task to stay united as Europeans and to show Donald Trump that we cannot be played off one against the other and that we will prevent the multilateral system from collapsing. That's what he wants. That's what we don't want. We want to think about a post-Trump world where solidarity is back again between the United States and Europe. Now, turning to you, Mr. Zaradil, uh, we now have a stronger border and coast guard, something you support, but we also have a naval rescue mission in Europe that has no ships. Doesn't that condemn migrants to drowning in the Mediterranean? Well, I have heard Mr. Juncker saying that he would uh, like to find funds for employing 10,000 new members or employees in Frontex. I would say that if he has funds, he should rather try to assist national capacities in countries like Bulgaria or Spain or Italy, because I believe that their national capacities know better uh, on site how to tackle the situation. I think three or four weeks ago, I talked with a Bulgarian prime minister, and I just asked him if we had an option, uh, would you like to have stronger Frontex with more employees, or would you like rather to be assisted from the European Union by some, you know, solidarity package to help you with your national capacities? He, of course, choose the other option. So I would go rather in a way of strengthening national capacities of our border states. Thank you. We also have a follow-up question for you. Your natural ally seems to be the European People's Party, who is not here tonight, which is really a pity. But what would it take for you to make a deal with Frans Timmermans and the Socialists? They're so close together there. What would it be for you to make such a deal, handling him, handing him over the Commission presidency? Well, I have to say frankly that I would prefer other option. <laughs> Very brief answer. <laughs> <laughs> brief is good. Brief is good. Uh, now we turn to you, My Mr. Verhofstadt. Friends of Poland are part of his party, you know. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Mr Verhofstadt, you've been attacked on billboards and more by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. He receives more EU money than he pays, and he stands accused of trashing European values and rule of law. Would finding his government or holding back EU money fix the problem, or what else would? No, well, we have now a regulation about that. So finally, I think that uh, besides the Article 7 procedure, uh, we decided that in the future, when a country is not in accordance uh, with uh, the uh, values of the European Union, uh, that we will withdraw the money. Not the money uh, for the people, but for the government, for the administrations. And that's an, a new way uh, of thinking. Uh, and that is because I think uh, in the European Parliament, and also with, uh, with the support of the Commission, and that was Frans Timmermans was responsible for it, for the first time, we uh, didn't look away from these questions, neither in Poland, neither in Hungary and not even in Romania, I have to say. Or the Czech Republic. Uh, or the Czech Republic. I have no problem to tell them all. We put them out uh, of our group if they are not uh, uh, in, uh, in our quarters. But there is one point that we didn't trace uh, this evening. Why it is that we all cannot succeed in our proposal from time to time. Well, I have to tell you, that is the elephant in the room, the European Council, who is still deciding with unanimity and is blocking most of the fights that we have discussed this evening. Thank you, Mr. Verhofstadt. Thank you. Now, the question that we are going to pose you now is your chance to give final comments. We're already at the end, almost. We have a question from Ine Tollenaars, who is a campaigner with the anti-poverty NGO One in Brussels. Hi. Uh, well, as said, I'm an activist, and uh, in my experience, most politicians do not really have the political will or courage to really build and improve Europe, but instead they tend to focus on quick fixes and uh, crisis management. And how are you going to inspire the European citizen and especially young people? And more con concretely, what is your boldest idea for the future of Europe? Baz Eichert, the floor is yours. What is your boldest idea for Europe? The boldest idea is to make the Sustainable Development Goals, and that's where one stands for, its eradication of poverty, to make that the lead in all our policies, including our trade policies. Because this is one of our policies where, until now, trade and delivering on trade was the only aim. Whereas for the Greens, for me as a Commission President, it is about eradication of poverty. Make that central. That's why we do trade deals. That will create a race to the top instead of what we do now, a race to the bottom. This is really a fundamental shift in all our policies, agriculture policies, not being discussed today. Also here, all these parties have been supporting agriculture policies. Agriculture policies are having the huge impact on the third world countries as well. So make eradication of poverty, make the sustainable development goals key of our policies, and that would be my line as a president of the European Commission. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Tomic, what is your boldest idea? Well, uh, uh, concerning the trade policy, European Union is the biggest trade market, and it should have a very, very strict rules about what we are importing. And we should never have in our markets anything what is produced with slavery work, with children work, with destroying the nature, rainforests and oceans. And this will move all the earth in the different position. So we have to be responsible as Europeans because a lot depends of, on us. So, Poverty, extreme poverty on the earth is a big problem. That's why many people are running out of their countries. And uh, we have to help them to build their society that they can live safely there and not to jump anywhere with NATO and the weapons. <laughs> Thank you. Giva Hochstadt of Liberals and Democrats. Now, I was hesitating. I want to talk about European army, because I think it's the biggest waste of money inside the European Union to have 28 armies for the moment. But I will take something else, that is European migration policy. 
because the nationalists and the populists, I, well, I cannot understand, but I cannot accept, and I think it's the same for the others, that there are still thousands and thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean Sea at or door because of the lack of a European migration policy. Because when there is a problem with migration, whether it's asylum, it's not Europe that is the source of it. It's all the member states who are not willing to deal together with this issue. To have a European border and coast guard, for example. To have European asylum rules, the Dublin system, still blocked in the European Council. To have also a European economic migration, a type of a blue card. Because it's nonsense to talk about migration and to say, oh, they cannot enter. This is the lack of European migration policy that makes, in fact, the fortune of nationalists and populists. And that is what would be my first priority, to create it. Thank you. We now turn to Jan Zaradil. Floor is yours. Final statement. Well, perhaps I could start with what my constituents tell me. And my constituents tell me that they do want Europe that does less, but does it better. Sometimes they have a feeling that European Union is patronizing them, is lecturing them, is telling them how to live, what to do, and they are not happy with that. And this is my idea of the European Union of the future. I want scaled back European Union, I want looser and flexible European Union, I definitely do not want an empire, I do not want United States of Europe. I think that Europe should be multi-speed, multipolar and multi-currency, and I believe it should give enough space to its member states also to pursue their own policies whenever necessary and whenever it brings more benefit than some Europe-wide solution. And as I said before, not always the Europe-wide solution is the best solution. And now we turn to our final respondent, Franz Timmermans. You know, I can understand very well that if you're your age, did you think Europe is about crises? Because as long as you've been following Europe, we've been going from one crisis to the other. But we are capable of very bold things. My parents' generation saw an incredible thing, reconciliation between France and Germany, thought impossible. I saw myself the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reconciliation of the whole of Europe, which was thought impossible only a couple of years before. The next generation, our task, is to bring real reconciliation between Europe and Africa. That is the only way we're going to deal with the migration crisis. That is the only way we can retain our feeling of humanity. Because every time somebody dies in the Mediterranean, it's not they just dying, it's a piece of our humanity that is lost. And this opens the door to the nationalists, to the extremists, to the xenophobes. This opens the door to politicians describing other people as rats. We, I don't want to go back to that part of European history. I want us to embrace the future. And if you want one bold idea from me is embrace Africa as a sister continent that we need to develop together to create a prosperous future for all of us. That would be my bold idea for you. Now, that takes us to the end of candidate questions and answers, but we're not quite done yet. We want to know who you think won the debate. So make sure you go to slido.com, enter the tag Maastricht debate, and we'll give you a few seconds to do that to let us know who you think was the winner of the debate. Indeed, indeed. Was it Violetta Tomic, Tomic from the party of the European left? Or was it Franz Timmermans from the party of European socialists? Or perhaps Bas Eickhout from the party of the European Greens? Guy Verhofstadt from the Alliances of Liberals and Dem Democrats. Or, finally, was it Jan Zaradil from the Alliance of Conservatives of Europe? Let's see, Ryan, where we are heading We've towards. got to thank some partners first. We'll give people a few more seconds uh, to share their votes. Firstly, I want to make sure that we thank the three partners of Maastricht working on Europe. Maastricht University, the city of Maastricht, and the province of Limburg. Of course, the European Youth Forum were an essential partner, as were the European Journalism Centre and my own publication, Politico. Now let's take a look to see who you consider to be the winner. Well, yes. it's been that way all night long, hasn't it? Franz, Franz Timmermans, Timmermans, you are the you are choice in this vote. Give a warm applause. Debate, rather. <laughs> But 
I want to thank you all because I think that was a very interesting and stimulating debate. Of course, yes. I would say that, but I think it's actually true. Absolutely. And Baz Eichel, 36%, that's nothing to sniff at either. And it's still moving, so let's, the whole night it can continue. <laughs> thank, you. thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight and making the Maastricht debate such a wonderful experience and a real reality. And thank you for our candidates on stage, for your wonderful answers, for your performance. Thank you to our audience, both here and viewing live. And thank you to Ryan, my partner tonight. You're very welcome. I had a great time. Now, most importantly of all, thank you, Rihanna. And also, make sure you go out and vote. Continue this debate online with the hashtag Maastricht Debate. Get out there between the 23rd and the 26th of May and cast your vote. <laughs> and go to politico.eu forward slash EU 2019 if you want to follow further news about this election. Thank you to all of our candidates. And again, Rihanna. Thank you.